Good afternoon now. Good How afternoon. is everyone? Good. Um, my name is Tabitha Scoble. I'm the director here at Portland County Historical Society. If you haven't been here before, um, thank you for coming. We do have a few things to talk about just before I introduce Evan, one of which is uh, there's coffee and refreshments back there. I just started the coffee. I got a late start. I totally forgot to turn it on, but it will be there for you. And there's some cheese and crackers as well. Um, if you have a cell phone on you, you can silence that for the duration of the program. Uh, it is a little distracting when they go off. And trying to think what else we have coming up. Uh, next week we have David Wade Morton here and he'll be discussing um, joining hereditary societies like the DAR and the um, Mayflower Society. And he belongs to a lot of them and he spoke for us before. And he's a pretty good speaker. We enjoy having him. Um, Anything I'm forgetting? Can't think of anything today? Okay. So if there is an emergency of any kind, you can go out this door to the back of the room where you came in, or there's one just down this little hallway. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Evan Falkenberry, professor at the college, SUNY Portland. He's been here for about three years. Yeah, it's my fourth year now. Yeah, he sends a lot of students over here for great projects. We've been working on a um, historic marker project with his students, and we're continuing that this year. Uh, the goal is to make an app, or to put them all on an app so that people can drive around the county and see where all the markers are located in the historic buildings, and um, they'll get a little bit of information on their phone when they use this app. So the students are helping with that, and we're really grateful to have the manpower for that project. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, he's an all around great guy. He's got a library book club, and I keep needing to go to it, and I just don't get there, but I will one of these days, Evan. <laughs> yes, but not forever. So, anyway, Evan, thank you for coming. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. All right. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. So, Good morning. thanks for the nice introduction, Tabitha. I'm happy to be here. I love working here at the uh, Portland County Historical Society and um, you know campus is only I don't know a quarter of a mile from here something like that so as much as we can bridge the gap and keep students coming here for various projects that's what I like to do um, so maybe another time I can speak more about those kinds of student projects but today I'm here to talk about um, my new book <laughs> so um, uh, what I'll do is I'll just speak for no more than I'll keep an eye on the clock in the back My plan is just to speak for 15 20 minutes most about the subject of the book and what it's about and What I did and all that good stuff um, And then I'll, I'll be happy just to, to stop preaching at you and then instead to um, Just open it up for questions or comments and talk about whatever else that might be on your minds or want to know more about um, but my book is called uh, Poll Power, um, The Voter Education Project and the Movement for the Ballot in the American South. I actually have um, a couple of copies here, so um, uh, if you want to flip through it, um, check it out, pass it around. It's okay if you get a little uh, baloney on it, you know, it's all right, it's durable, uh, totally fine. Um, but, um, so I'll just kind of talk first a little bit about what it, what it is, how I got into it. So back in 2010, um, I started uh, graduate school at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And at that point in time, I was 23 or 24, just a, just a kid, just a child still, I think, baby. immature, baby. still a baby, yeah. Um, but I knew I loved history and I knew I wanted to, to teach history, to hopefully be a professor one day. And, I had this kind of vague idea of what that looked like and what I wanted to do. Um, and so I started graduate school and I was fortunate to get a job in uh, the library there, in my, their archives. And they put me to work doing all kinds of different things. Um, one of which was to look at the history of the civil rights movement in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, they had a rich collection of materials and objects and all that sort of thing. And the Civil Rights Movement, 1960s mostly, uh, 50, well, it was much bigger than that. But, um, but in the 60s, Charlotte experienced a lot of stuff going on with the Civil Rights Movement. Lots of marches, 
lots of sit-ins, lots of violence, um, and it was really a, an interesting history. And as I looked at some records, I noticed that um, there was a, 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 a campaign there in 1963 to register voters. And this campaign uh, was really successful. And over a course of probably four or five months, registered several thousand African Americans, wow. uh, who before, in that day and age, was very, very, very difficult uh, for African Americans to register to vote, um, especially in the South. Um, this was before a lot of the major federal legislation like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and all that sort of thing. And so I found that out and then I saw that um, yes. this campaign had gotten a bunch of money uh, from something called the Voter Education Project. And I never heard of that before, I'd never seen it before. And um, I looked at it a little bit and, and couldn't find much out. So I kind of just moved right along. Um, I'm skipping a few steps here, and what happened next was I decided, after finishing graduate school for my master's, I decided to, you know, if I'm going to do a master's, I might as well just keep uh, torturing myself and get a PhD. And, uh, you know, just go as far as I can with, with my education. And so that's what I did. I plunged in, and um, I went to the uh, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for that. And, you know, for a PhD, you have to write uh, the dissertation. You know, the, the almighty dissertation, which is like the big uh, research paper, several hundred pages and all that sort of thing. And so I kept thinking, you know, what am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? And so I remembered uh, this story about uh, where um, this campaign in Charlotte for voters had been so successful and had been able to do so through money they got from something called the Voter Education Project. So I looked a little bit more and I found no one had really written about the Voter Education Project. No one really knew what it was. I mean, a few people knew what it was, but um, not many historians. Uh, and so I decided that would be the subject of my dissertation. Um, so I, in four years, got that done. And then over the last three years, since I've been a, um, an assistant professor here at SUNY Cortland, I've turned my um, dissertation into a book which is the book that's being passed around now. So that was based on my dissertation. Um, but basically what I found out was um, the Voter Education Project basically uh, paid for the Civil Rights Movement in the South. Um, so I'll slow down and I'll come back to that. But one of the things they did was they published different kinds of material. So if you can't read it, or if it's too, if it's too kind of warped there, it says, um, he is not registered to vote because he's a mule. What's your excuse? <laughs> so they like to kind of put out this sort of um, uh, eye-catching uh, uh, material to try to, you know, hit at people's hearts for um, why they're not registering, why they're not voting, why they're not participating in democracy, and that sort of thing. Um, but essentially, the Voter Education Project was this really small office in Atlanta, Georgia. They started up in 1962. They only usually had a staff of about three or four or five people. So it was really, really small. But what these few people did was they wrote a bunch of grant applications to like the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, some of those big ones y'all may have heard of, as well as a lot of little ones too, at basically asking for money to say we um, in the South have this thing called Jim Crow, which is still alive and well, and most African Americans can't uh, register or vote or participate equally in democracy. And so a lot of these foundations, they sent money, uh, grants, to the Voter Education Project, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions, over the total course of its existence. And the VEP collected all that money, and then they basically chopped it up into small amounts. And they sent it to places all across the South, to Texas, to Alabama, to Tennessee, to Virginia, to South Carolina, to North Carolina, to Florida, to Mississippi, to Georgia, to Arkansas. Am I missing any southern states? <laughs> I think that's most of them. At least that's the old Confederacy. Um, 
But basically, the VEP chopped up the money and would send $500 here, $1,000 there, $5,000 there to local voter registration campaigns in Chattanooga, in Atlanta, in Charlotte, in Richmond, in Montgomery, in Houston. Um, and they would go to local people there, like local community leaders, like leaders of the NAACP, or um, the National Urban League, or like a local organization. And they would spend the money uh, for a three week, or six week, or six month voter campaign to basically get people out and register to vote. So they would spend the money um, in a variety of ways. They would um, you know, use the money to print flyers, you know, advertising, hey, let's, we're gonna go down to the courthouse to register to vote this day and time. Uh, they would use the money to put uh, uh, fuel in cars to basically organize carpools. Because a lot of uh, rural black southerners live way out, um, far from the courthouse where they would register to vote and maybe didn't have a car. And so um, they would use that to just organize carpools. Um, they used the money to pay for food for people like spending a day knocking door to door, you know, to, to give them something to eat. Um, they would even use the money sometimes to pay for uh, babysitters so that uh, mothers, for the most part, some fathers, but mostly mothers, could get out and spend their days trying to get people to register to vote. Um, so the money went fast. <laughs> uh, most people didn't have a lot of money of their own to, to donate to this kind of thing. But uh, over the years, the VEP, with all this money from foundations, collected it in Atlanta and then sent it out in little amounts. And over time, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of more black Southerners registered to vote before um, the federal government passed the, voter, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which made it much easier. So before that federal legislation, the VEP kind of did the work, the groundwork, to register people to vote. Um, so up here, there's a picture of uh, Stephen Courier and Audrey Courier. And um, um, they're not well known at all uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, they died really young in a, a plane crash um, in 1967. Uh, but before that, um, at their own foundation, they sent hundreds of thousands into the millions of dollars to the VEP. And they were just, they were honestly just really rich New Yorkers. <laughs> And, but they felt um, that their money, you know, a lot of foundations like to donate to the arts, you know, and to uh, the public good and this kind of thing. And, and that's great. They wanted to do something different. So they decided to send it south to help register Southern black Americans to register to vote. That's where a lot of the money came from. And this is a picture of Wiley Branton. He was um, the VEP's director for its first um, three years. Um, from 1962 uh, to 1965. And so he was the one basically sitting in a small office in Atlanta, writing grants, getting a bunch of money in, and then coordinating with hundreds of different people, thousands across the South about, you know, how much money do you need? Okay, a check's in the mail. Um, what do you want to do to register people in your community in, in, um, in Dallas, Texas? Um, okay, $3,000, you should get it next week. So he kind of was sort of the, the financier of the civil rights movement, in a way, for several years. And we don't know anything about, we know very little about him and about the VEP, the Voter Education Project, because they, they didn't want the attention. You know, they didn't want to be out in the public eye. They didn't want to be, um, uh, they didn't want to get press. They wanted to kind of stay in the background and just handle the money and kind of coordinate things, but not get in the way or draw attention um, away from, or draw attention to themselves in case, you know, I mean, because there were a lot of uh, people that didn't want black Americans to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And so they felt that if the spotlight fell on their work, then maybe um, the money might dry up. So they stayed in the background to help. Um, uh, let me skip that one. But here's another picture. This is from the early 1970s. The VEP kept working into the 70s. Um, 
you might recognize, this is uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, from Georgia, who's still in the House today, and uh, Julian Bond, who was another civil rights activist. Um, but John Lewis uh, led, the, the, led the Voter Education Project uh, from 1970 to 1976. Um, and he resigned from the VEP in, in 1976 in order to run for Congress, where he's still at today. So before John Lewis got into Congress, uh, the six years prior to that, he was the one trying to get the money and trying to like help local organizations and local people across the South register to vote. Um, so the VEP did um, a lot of behind the scenes work and uh, they also kind of did these marketing campaigns. So here there's an old flyer of, you probably recognize him, Muhammad Ali. And, um, you know, so they would try to um, publicize how important voting was. You know, it's your fight, vote. It's the greatest equalizer. Um, they wanted to try to get the message across that, uh, you know, registering, voting, it's not just the act of registering and voting, but in doing so, you're having a say in local power, in state power, in who runs things. Um, it's your voice. If you don't like the way things are going, you have the power to work collectively and try to get new leadership in. Um, so that was one of the messages of the VEP. Um, but essentially, over the decades, uh, really mostly concentrated in the 1960s, a little bit into the 70s. The VEP, tiny office, they collected money and they sent it all across the South. Um, hundreds of thousands of people registered because of the VEP's work. So I like to think of the VEP as sort of the, the underlying behind the scenes um, engine or uh, money machine behind the civil rights movement. We don't often think about where the money came from in the civil rights movement, but it, to organize such a big social movement had to come from so, somewhere. Um, and uh, it was really the VEP that did it. Um, the VEP, they, uh, um, they continued their work into the 70s, but their work became much more difficult um, after 1970 uh, because Congress passed an act called um, the Tax Reform Act of 1969. There was a number of these tax bills, of course, all the time, but this one, uh, in part tried to hurt the VEP because a lot of uh, Southern white senators and congressmen were quite unhappy with how all this money was going into black activist hands. And so they put some, uh, some language into the law to try to stop the money. It did continue, but they had a much more hard and difficult time raising the money and helping out. Um, but essentially the VEP kind of um, didn't do as much into the 70s and 80s, and then it uh, finally closed down in 1992. So it lasted quite a while. Um, but um, what I've noticed now is that there's really nothing like the VEP around anymore. Some kind of organization raising money for local people to just have to, to work to register to vote. And um, uh, with all the money that foundations raise and donate now, it seems like um, it would be uh, nice to, to have that again. But, um, but um, that's the long and short of it. So I thought that maybe now I would stop preaching at you and um, just have a conversation. If there's anything more y'all want to know about or ask questions about or comment or, or we can just have a conversation amongst ourselves now with the rest of our time. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is that organization any place except Georgia? Well, their main office was in Atlanta, but they worked. Um, they sent money out throughout the South. So they were located in Georgia, but they worked in um, 11 different states um, across the South. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, good question. Well, that just involved, it was it directed to black Americans or there were poor whites living a long way from wherever with no education and <clears throat> without access. Were they included? I'm, I'm sure they weren't excluded right. primarily, but were they also part of the uh, get out to vote? Were they, you know, when they were found, right. 
Yeah, so great. It wasn't exclusively black. Yeah, great question. No, it wasn't exclusively black, um, but the target audience was definitely black Americans because the thought was, yes, many poor white Southerners um, were disenfranchised in similar ways. Um, but a lot of the money, they had to be specific when they were raising the money to say what the money was going to be used for. And so I think that the, the big selling point for them was, you know, in the South, um, they still had Jim Crow, which, you know, segregated life in all aspects. Um, walking down the sidewalk, eating at restaurants, going to movie theaters, you know, the white water fountains, the black water fountains, you know, we've seen that. But um, so the VEP really did try to um, emphasize that we're trying to help black Americans vote. Um, but at the same time, if more white Southerners, poor white Southerners who um, were in community uh, and, and felt disenfranchised as well, yeah, they, I don't think they would have said like, no, you can't come, <laughs> you know, or you can't be a part of it. But the target audience was definitely black Americans. Yeah. Good question. Thanks for asking. You talk all about registering them to vote. Yeah. Did the VEP do anything about getting them to actually go to the polls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On board on election days. They did, but that was they did, but they were also very, very careful to not ever appear partisan. Mm -hmm. So um, their emphasis was on registration and making sure people knew like when election day was and uh, yeah, getting out the vote, that sort of thing. So yes, um, they did emphasize actually voting as well. Um, but in doing so, they, they just had to be more careful with their language to never appear uh, like they were supporting any particular candidate or party or anything like that. Because all the foundation money coming to them, it had to be um, tax exempt. And if there was any indication of partisanship, then the tax exemption would be you know, nullified. Sure, but I'm talking about, did they like ride vehicles to help them get to the polling mm -hmm. places? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the campaigns, the registration campaigns would span several weeks or months, usually around, you know, October, November, mm -hmm. uh, when there would be elections. So at the same time when elections would be campaigning and going on, they would be emphasizing registering, and then you can vote at this, at this uh, election on this day. So yeah, the carpools that I talked about earlier, um, all that sort of thing, yeah, it involved both registration as well as get out the vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question. Anything else I can talk about? Or? Yeah. Do you think that there's been um, sort of residual or legacy voting because of this project? Say the parents then pass that on to their children so that they would continue to vote, you know, things like that? are cyclical, like poverty is cyclical. Right. Could voting be something that they were able to carry forward, yeah. do you know? Yeah, my sense is yes, absolutely. Um, um, I can't speak to specifics, but I imagine that, um, you know, uh, a lot of families and people had to struggle to vote mm -hmm. uh, several generations ago. I think that that sticks and is passed down, the importance of democracy and active citizenship and registering and voting. Um, yeah, I think it's all connected. And I um, um, saw a lot of photographs in my research. A lot of kids were involved in this kind of registration work, a lot of teenagers. So even though they weren't um, uh, 18 or 21 uh, um, and couldn't vote yet, they would be involved like going door to door, knocking on doors, canvassing, passing out registration forms, helping with carpools, mm -hmm. um, helping people vote. So I think there was a, there was a generational uh, connection of helping register to vote during this period. So I imagine that that also contributed to a kind of legacy, as you mentioned. So yeah, good question. Was, was your hand up as well? Um, yeah, I saw a series of the Reconstruction, I think it was Ken Burns. Right. And I always thought that right after the Civil War, Johnson was a horrible president, <laughs> and things were rough. But in this series, it, they had more rights, the blacks right after. They got to be senators, they got to be judges. 
And then, like four or five years later, yeah. boom. Yeah. So it wasn't Johnson that was so bad with the blacks. It seemed to be after him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, I don't know. I guess they did needed a little time to get organized with the Ku Klux Klan and everything, or <laughs> something like that. It took them, and then they could hardly vote. Right. Kind of thing. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, when the big kind of emphasis on civil rights and voting rights happened, I mean, there the 15th Amendment <laughs> had been passed in the 1870s, 1873, and so why? Why do we need all this help to register black Americans when the Constitution says mm -hmm. that anybody can register? Um, well, it's, it's because that southern states, um, they put in all these barriers uh, to vote uh, for black Americans by uh, using literacy tests, um, uh, poll taxes, um, outright violence. <laughs> um, all these mechanisms of uh, states imposed basically to kind of get around the 15th Amendment and say, well, yeah, the Constitution says you can vote, but we're going to put all these obstacles in your way. And that had the net effect over the 70 or 80 years or so of the Jim Crow era of keeping uh, voting power in the South largely in white hands. Um, and so it took the Civil Rights Movement and the VEP to like, you know, knock it down. Um, but yeah, um, it's, you can't, um, I'm glad that you mentioned Reconstruction because the whole Civil Rights Movement doesn't make sense without thinking first about Reconstruction, or slavery, Civil War, Reconstruction, and then the fall of Reconstruction and the, the new growth of segregation. Oh, yeah. Uh Recently, there were some stories about uh, closing polling places, and the, I forget what state it was. It was one district that had six polling places, and they closed all of them but one, and the intent being to really disenfranchise the poor people because they, there was no public transit in this area. And, and it sounds like we're going back to a need for something like this because they're finding new ways to disenfranchise people. The repeal or the striking down of the uh, the uh, voter uh, rights le uh, federal legislation. I mean, that's kind of opened the door for a, a repeat of all these things now. I think. Yeah, I totally agree. It's um. We gotta get John Lewis out there again. I know, right? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> I know, I know. Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, to, at least in America, that's all I can speak to. Democracy is never like a a sure thing, you know. I mean, we all live in a democracy. We, um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that equality and freedom exist in the same way for everybody. There's always fights over who gets the freedom, who gets the rights, and um, and you're right. I think that um, you know the 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 VP during the civil rights era saw a need to like bolster uh, people who needed some help. Um, uh, getting the same kind of d democratic rights that everybody else had. Um, and the VEP is gone, the, the civil rights movement has, has ended. Um, but uh, like true equality is still a far away thing, right? In a lot of ways. So you're right, I don't have the answer. Um, but I think, but I agree that um, something like the VEP now or a more of like a, a big engine um, to register, you know, disenfranchised, forgotten, kind of cast off people, both to register and get them to the polls would be helpful. Because I think, you know, I mean, yes, anybody, American citizens can register and vote. Um, that sounds like it's easy for everybody to do. And the reality is that, you know, I mean, there's uh, such a big percentage every election day that don't vote. And I'm not saying it's their fault, but maybe there's, maybe we need more emphasis on it, more help, more carpools, mm -hmm. having election day, a, a national holiday, you know, yeah. to, you know, these kinds of things would help to, to bring people out um, and not um, water down the vote. So, 
Yeah. I, I'm just reading lately, um, some Indian tribes out in the West are having a problem because they don't have streets. They you have can't say I live at, you know, 27 uh, Smith Street or something. Oh, yeah. There, there's sure. no such thing. They're, right. The whole tribe has the same address, I mm -hmm. guess. I'm not sure, but yeah. they're not allowed to vote because they don't have a street address. Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah, so we know they're <laughs> impediment. Yeah, citizens, but voting is not easy, huh? No, and one of the biggest problems is people get complacent and they don't bother with anything except themselves. I'm finding that right now in court and it's driving me nuts. I haven't quite figured out how to do anything about it. Every now and then I write a letter to the paper, but I usually have to calm down so I don't <laughs> 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 so Every I don't person thinking their vote doesn't count, but over time, if all yeah, those people right. add yeah, up, it really yeah. does count. Yeah. Yeah. People have an attitude that it's going to happen whether I vote or not, so yeah. why, you know, why go out of my way or why speak yeah. up? Or, right. uh, I often put in the paper that I'll take somebody to a poll mm -hmm. if they need yep. a ride, but yeah. sometimes I get somebody and sometimes I don't. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Every little bit helps. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's crazy. Um, the literacy requirement. Uh, I know it was still <clears throat> here in New York State in the late 1950s. Yeah. Because I'm aware of. Uh, we were living on Cedar Street, and one block over, a black family moved in to Cortland. I think it was in the Brains. late, yeah, the, the late 50s. And I'm aware that Mr. and Mrs. Bryant went to register to vote, and he couldn't sign his name. Mm -hmm. So they sent him to the courthouse to take a literacy test. Well, he couldn't sign his name. He couldn't pass the literacy test. And he just never voted, and that's no. New York State here. Mm. When did when did the literacy uh, mm -hmm. item? Uh, when was it? Uh, what do I want to say? Offed? About <laughs> right. It? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so the, does it still appear today? Right. Is there uh, a literacy requirement mm -hmm. today? For the for the most part, the in 1964, the Civil Rights Act. Okay. Um, um, or excuse me, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act basically said, you know, poll taxes, literacy tests, all the all these other like state manufactured impediments to voting okay. are illegal. Okay. Um, so it was really not until 1965. And uh, what was common too is that um, literacy tests, as they were administered, they didn't. I mean, sure, there were some people who had trouble reading and writing, but more often than not, literacy tests were just used as a tool that local registrars could use at their own discretion to just disenfranchise anybody they wanted to. Even if somebody was perfectly literate and could read, um, write, totally fine, um, they would still kind of make them do a kind of phony literacy test. Like, for, like perhaps um, they would say, um, okay, uh, Tell me, write down the First Amendment to the Constitution oh and, and tell me exactly what it means. Well, somebody might not have it memorized, or they might, and they could write it all out word for word and then talk about what it means, but then the registrar could be like, no, that's not what it means, <laughs> based on just their own ideas or prejudice, and say, you, you failed the literacy test. And so it was this really arbitrary way to just keep people that they didn't want voting off the rolls. But it took the 1965 law to get away, get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. So I guess if it's a state to state decision, you got to move around. You got to you got to do some research and move around. Oh, I'm moving out of here and I'm going to Maryland. Or I'm yeah. going to Ohio. Or I'm going to yeah. Each state did their own just, thing. Just just to make any sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Each state could do whatever they wanted to in a lot of ways with registration or voting. Most of us that are sitting, well, a lot of us that are sitting here today, I'm sure have very vivid recall, I personally do, 
And when I moved from New York State, where my roommate in nursing school was a black girl from uh, Newfield or Aetna or Vard or something, she, she was a lot of fun. She danced and she kept her beer in the back of the toilet tank and <laughs> we all parted together. And she was just another person. Uh, but then I moved south and I, I, I drew a straw that said, I guess I'll go to Washington. There's a lot of places to work down there. Well, in the newspaper, the headline every night was, if something bad happened downtown, it happened by B-L-A-C-K in the headline. It, it, and, I, and I was sharing a, an apartment with a girl from Newfoundland. There just aren't too many people, black people in Newfoundland. So her whole itinerary, although she, I don't know why, she went to Washington to live. She worked at another hospital there. I thought, well, who brought you to Washington if all these people scare you to death? Um, she, she really studied all those headlines, and that's where she got it in her mind that they're here and I'm here and never the twain shall meet. Yeah. But she yeah, didn't tell me that. She yeah. didn't tell me that until after I brought one of my friends home from work, who was a girl of color, yeah. and we sat on the porch, and yeah. boy, this roommate of mine went through the apartment and back like a bullet. Oh, no. Don't ever bring one of them in here again. And I'm thinking, oh, no. them who them? You know, I got in the back seat of a bus when I left New York State to go south. And the driver kept yelling, I'm not moving the bus until you get out of the seat. And I thought, why is he being so rude to somebody? Finally, he got up and he came to the back of the bus and he said, I'm telling you, you've got to move up. And I'm going, oh, he's talking to me. So I moved up two seats. I mean, I could have been just parks and in that seat and not moving, but I moved up two seats. I said, well, I guess I can move up two seats. And then I went into the black cafeteria in Richmond. And I know what it's like to be at a gross minority. I looked around and I said, whoa, I guess they got two cafeterias. <laughs> so I was living in a transition at the same time you're talking about. Wow. Yeah. 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. I have a friend like that too. She went. I think she went to the University of Virginia, and she couldn't get over. Why are you talking to these people? And and you can't do that because that's the black section and blah blah blah. She she couldn't get over it. And and not just people, but um, I mean, uh, uh, students, but uh, professors too. And there was one nice. math teacher at the high school, Mr. King, that was the black gentleman yeah. lived on yeah. mm -hmm. Hamlin Street. Other than that, in the Sam's yeah, we had were very minimal. One teaching in history here, uh -huh. when I uh, was still teaching school, and he was mm -hmm. a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. He still is. Yeah. Back to the very beginning, you spoke about the Curry family. Was there a reason? <coughs> reason why they got involved and it was that Curry family from Curry or and Ives, was that where the money came from? <laughs> it wasn't. I thought that it was uh, at first when I saw that name as well. But no, not connected to Curry or and Ives. Um, the, the money actually, so Stephen Currier, he did come from a, a wealthy family, um, but the real money... There was came, a wife. <laughs> yeah, the real money came from Audrey Currier, her grandfather, um, was Andrew Mellon. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yes, Whoa. that's money. <laughs> that's yes. money. So she came from the Mellon clan uh -huh. and she inherited a ton of money. <laughs> so <coughs> very young as well. At their demise in 1967, you said there was a plane crash? Yes. Was it a private plane? Was there possibly tampering or was it anything like that? Any, anything that would have been against the, the organization they were supporting? There's no evidence of that mm -hmm. I've ever seen. Um, they were um, heading to somewhere in the Bahamas, I think, for vacation, okay. yeah, on a pli private plane, <coughs> and um, the plane just disappeared, and it was never found. Oh my God. Um, yeah, so a lot of people were, yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, really sad, and um, uh, so the VEP like, lost one of their main like benefactors in that. But um, they were really young. You know, when they got married and, and when they inherited a lot of money, like, I don't, I don't know the exact amount, but it was an insane amount. And so they just thought, you know, as young, brash people can do, they just thought, well, let's start a foundation and let's 
spend money in like unique areas. And to them, a unique area was, and they just they just felt um, sympathy, I think, for black Americans uh, who didn't have the kinds of rights and privileges they had. Um, and so they were from a different world, but they just felt, let's use our money for good in this way. So I suspect too, when you did your research, did you see which party they registered with in the smaller, I mean, you, you go to a rural area and all of a sudden there's 50 more Democrats or 50 more Republicans. Was it different in each area where they're right. being registered or where did they stand? It was definitely different in each area. However, at the same time, you know, in the South, uh, from the 1890s through the 1960s, the South was pretty much a one-party region. Mm -hmm. you know, the Republican Party was almost absent entirely. And this is, you know, for white Americans for the most part. And that's because, you know, during Reconstruction, the Republican Party was seen as um, the Radical Party, the party that helped um, former slaves, that sort of thing. So the Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party was taken over by white supremacists in the 1890s. And because of 60, 70 years of just total dominant control of one party across 11 states, when more black Americans um, in the 1960s were registering to vote, the Republican Party just hadn't been there for 70, 80 years. And so they almost entirely registered as Democrats. And so rather than them just kind of taking over a separate party, mm -hmm. they just moved right into the one party that was there. And so most black Americans registered, black Southerners registered as Democrats because it was the only party that was there. So they kind of reimagined uh, what the Democratic Party stood for. And as a result, into the 1970s and 80s, um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of white Southerners left the Democratic Party for the Republican Party. So, and that's kind of in part of part of the origins of what we have today. Um, so, yeah, good question. <laughs> what were the Dixie Crats? Wasn't there a split in the South? Yeah, definitely. That that started in 1948. Um, um, yeah, with Trump. Yeah, yeah, and um, Strom Thurmond. And there was a big walkout of uh, segregationists at the Democratic National Convention and they decided to run their own candidate for office on a kind of Dixiecrat or um, you know purely like segregation white supremacy platform uh, but uh, the Dixiecrats only lasted uh, but the nickname stuck but it was really only about that 1948 election mm. I think we're out of time now uh, but I'm happy to stick around and keep chatting, answering questions. But thank you all for, for coming and for listening and being a part of the conversation. You'll bring a few copies of your book in there.